welcome to Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers. And its monthly author showcase. I am your host, Peter Stockwell. Author Mark Miller is visiting with us this month at the Bremerton Kitsap Access Television Studios. I have known Mark for the last couple of years, working with him to learn marketing skills, attending events in the county, and meeting with our group, CLAW. After retiring from a government law enforcement a few years ago, Mark joined me as a retired person undertaking the task of writing and publishing a novel. After a few years of revisions and editing his story, it is now available. Mark, you and I have published and marketed several books. We have learned much over the last year. Tell us about your experience writing and publishing your book, Tales of the Sklaw Infestation free-range protocol. This whole process was begun probably years ago when I actually thought I was going to be an investigative reporter and a journalist. And due to a whole bunch of odd things that happened, like always happen in life, and we're talking like very ancient history because I'm definitely not a young whippersnapper anymore, I somehow wound up getting shifted over to um, law enforcement and wound up doing that for 30 years. One thing in law enforcement, of course, is, well, two things in law enforcement. Number one, you meet a lot of unusual people and you get involved with a lot of unusual things. And also, contrary to what Hollywood shows, there's an awful lot of writing. It's report writing, it's complaint writing, it's testifying in court, it's all that thing. So you learn a, definitely a style of writing. Now, it's not a fiction style of writing. Yeah. But it's a style of writing. But I've always been interested in, in writing because of that. So once I retired, once again by sheer happenstance, some small independent online company contacted me and said, why don't you try to publish a book through us? So I said, well, why don't I? So I went ahead and wrote um, an original story under another nom de plume. My current nom de plume I write under is Marshall Miller, but I also have an, another one that I wrote years ago just as an experiment. Mm -hmm. So and you and I have had this discussion about, well, the first book you write, it's kind of like <laughs> the big experiment, and usually half of it winds up in the trash can. So that was it. It was a big experiment. I put it up on just, just on e-books with this little independent company. It didn't cost me very much money at all. Of course, they were trying to then sell me every possible type of marketing you could, which included was, for $10,000, we'll help you write a screenplay and get to Hollywood. You know, that was one of the pitches yeah. they were giving. Well, after that little experiment, I started going around to a, a couple of the local writers group here in, in Kitsap County, because, of course, you know, like I said, I'd retired now back up here, figuring out something to do with my, you know, spare time that was halfway enjoyable. And the other thing that I ran up to with that was, there's unfortunately a lot of people that get into quote unquote writing groups who are kind of like legends in their own mind. So they We've want a few, haven't we? Yes, we have. Yeah. They want you to write like they want you to write whether they've ever published in their life or not. And so in every, and you know this, Peter, every writer has a, his own voice and style. And they're also quite often different genres. And I know there's people out there that want to cookie cut stuff, but it, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't really work. You have to write with your own voice. So then stumbling around, I bumped into what is now CLAW with you and a, a another small uh, core of people. At the same time, I discovered uh, Kitsap Publishing and Printing with, with Ingemar uh, Anderson up in, in Polsbo, and he's kind of a startup publisher. So he's the one that helped get me going on the actual figuring out how we're going to publish these books, both a, a print version and also ebook versions to get it out there. And it's been this ongoing learning process about marketing, distribution, and all that stuff that I, most people don't really, and I didn't really understand now, especially with the day of the internet, um, just how much different ways there are to market and to distribute and to try to get your, your, your word out there and your work out there. And you and I, of course, we've gone through this together on some of our festivals and state fairs and things like this, actually trying to sell the books. And that's been a learning experience yeah. as to 
who's interested in what genres, what sells and what doesn't. So have you enjoyed being a part of the founding of CLAW? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, in a way we, we the original CLAW, yeah, there was another organization prior to us that other people kind of helped create, but yeah. We kind of stole it, didn't we? We kind of stole it, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what we did. We stole it. We stole. There's probably some people there that are going to come after us with pitchforks here. <laughs> but um, it's the whole idea was with Claw, we decided that, hey, there's a gazillion people out there that want to teach you how to write. But nobody sits down and says, hey, I tried to market my book this way. I tried to get my book published this way. I tried to sell my book this way. Nobody ever sits down and says, I tried to do that, and boy, did I screw up. Or I tried to do that, and boy, I'm becoming a millionaire. Yeah. So that's kind of what we're doing is we get together and we try to plan, and that's what led to, of course, this beautiful show here with BCAT Studios, was the idea of how do you get, especially startup authors that might be on their first book, how do you get their face and their name and their works out there to the general public, especially here in Kitsap County, which unfortunately is quite often ignored because we have this huge monolith called Seattle across the water. Yeah, and an awful lot of authors are over here. Yeah. Well, you know, plots are dreamed up from the experiences we live. Do you have something in your history to model the story that you have? <laughs> Free range protocol? Are you really from another planet? No, but I've actually been to Area 51. Okay. But that's a whole other additional <laughs> story. Um, the... Um, I started, I've always been interested in science fiction, even though I've got this long history in law enforcement. And right now I do have a thriller sitting at this oddest of odd things. Or a romance publisher is looking at a thriller I wrote based on my law enforcement experience. And they're, they're tearing it apart as we speak to see if they want to actually publish it. But I've always been interested in, in science fiction. So I've got this idea of, because I don't do anything simple. I guess I should. So I decided I'm going to create this whole alien species called the Tasha, which is based on cephalopods, i.e. squids and octopuses, because we have found out our ocean squids and octopi and our deep sea squids, we think, are a lot more intelligent than we realize. Um, it's a different type of intelligence, but it's, a, it's severe intelligence. So I thought, what would happen if this alien species came to Earth because they looked at us as a form of meat, of cattle. In other words, uh, yes, exactly. Food. It, we're food. Just as if we went to some other world, or for that matter, when we were exploring in our days of sailing ships, we would land on some island and we'd find some new creature yeah. and we'd say, oh, let's eat that, you know, or well, let's eat its eggs, or that's how they wiped out the dodo bird, but I guess they ate all the eggs. Yeah. So things like that was what would happen if an alien came here? And of course, we're going to sit there and go, hey guys, wait a minute, we're a, a, a sentient race. How dare you try to eat us? Well, the same thing, I mean, what does a cow or a dog or something think when we used to eat dogs? They probably looked at us and said, what are you doing eating me for? You know, what did I do to you type thing? So that was kind of the idea. So they land and they actually invade. And of course, humans being the way we are, we're some of our own worst enemies some of the humans actually take the side to the aliens because, you know, for whatever other peripheral reason, I create a subset of, of complete, I would say, insane people that are humans that, that are identifying with aliens because we as human beings have a tendency of having this dark side. Mm -hmm. So I examine through the science fiction our dark side. At the same time, I also examine our light side, our good side. And I try to get people to think about those two things. But that's what the whole thing about the, the series of books that I wrote. The first one, Free Range Protocol, this little book right here, is um, basically short story setting the story up. It's yeah. pre-invasion through the initial days of the invasion. The last three books, um, of the three volumes, are actually what one individual called a war and peace of alien squid invasion novels. Because once I started writing, it turned into this big, huge epic, trying to explain, because that's what I felt needed to be doing. Not only explain the alien culture and how they look at us, but how do we react to that 
and how all of a sudden we're re a portion of humanity is rebelling against the fact that no, we're not going to no longer be your cattle. We're not going to no longer be your subservient client race or something like that. But at the same time, make readers think about the f way that other humans treat each other at the same time that they're facing this odd you know, uh, threat. So your experiences in government have helped you craft this book. You said you'd been to Area <laughs> yeah, 51. Exactly. <laughs> so how do you fashion these stories? Um, and, and do you have a writing schedule you follow? I just I try to write every day, and sometimes I write more than others. But um, the books I try to base the characters, the human characters, based on people I actually knew. So sometimes some of my heroes and heroines and villains and villainesses are based on people I knew, or or conglomerations of people I know. Nobody recently. No. Oh, good. Yeah, no, keeps keeps me like, safe. Yeah, it keeps you safe. Uh, but it's based, because I think that if you, ba if you write based on what you know and the people you know and the experiences you know, it becomes more truthful. Um, you were an educator. We had this discussion before where I asked, well, why didn't you write up the down staircase, <laughs> you know, type <laughs> book. And, and, but at the same time, um, uh, you have to admit that probably some of your characters are based on people you knew or oh yeah. experiences you knew. It's very hard to just have this complete clear slate of all of a sudden pulling you know, a name out of a hat. Conversely, of course, when you're trying to write about an alien species, <laughs> which is what I tried to do in creating a culture, I didn't want them to be bug-eyed monsters like the old 1950s movies. They needed to be a non-humanoid type of, of species that's unique enough to be interesting, but also have an, enough in common because of their intelligence that we could communicate. So it's kind of like the Michael Rennie character in To Serve Man, which was a show, I think it was... Was um, it the Twilight Zone episode? Twilight Zone. Yeah. The and it turned out it was a cookbook. Yeah. But the Serve Man was a Twilight Zone episode yeah. for a half hour where that's exactly what happened. You had this huge race that supposedly was giving us everything. And at the very end, we find out that, no, they're just looking at us they're as They're just fattening us up yeah. for the next meal. And, but that, and that's part of the, there's in, my, in my series is the examination of, okay, what would happen if cattle could talk back to us? <laughs> I'm getting at. If a cow sat there and could explain to us, now wait a minute, why are you eating me, okay? Would we keep eating them, you know? Uh, I'd have a little difficulty eating e something that talked to me. Exactly. So, and that comes through the story because part of the plot, I don't want to give too much away because it's got some twists and turns. And by the way, for all you young ladies out there, the female of the gender basically saved the world of both species. And I'm not going to tell you how they do it, but they managed to do it. But anyways... The, <laughs> yeah. I, the I'm just, <laughs> the female of the species usually does save they the world. Exactly. And that's why, uh, that's part of the other, other thing of the story is the fact that I was also delving into, like I said, the human condition and yeah. how we react with each other. But also then taking it over and reacting with the, this alien species. So it's this constant give and take, bouncing back and forth. Partway through the story, they found out the alien species is trying to actually modify our genome to, quote, unquote, make us better, just like we breed dogs. And that's their excuse they use, is this one alien lord looks at this one main character and goes, well, you guys created all these different breeds of dogs from wolves. What's the main <laughs> difference? Well, we're just trying to do the same thing with you guys. What are you so irritated about, you know? Because we know. Exactly. Right. But that's that whole... It's a, I guess part of it has to do with the reality of, uh, of what we consider as good and what other people may consider good sometimes conflict because of cultures. So and, and that's the other thing, like I said, examining not only human condition but just the condition of being in an, in an intelligent species. Well, most authors I met, as I've said before, and are really looking to become an entity in the literary world, yeah. and they want to find the story. Do you feel like maybe you got one? Well, what I've are your goals as an author? Um, I've got a story. I started writing just because I had this desire to write 
Uh, of course, every author, they're, they're lying if they say they don't like the idea of somebody reading and enjoying their stuff. You get a f <laughs> you sense of a feel of accomplishment that, oh, yeah, I like that, you know. Uh, but I've also realized that some people are going to like your stuff and some people are going to think that it's a pile of, you know, cow dung. That's true. And you have to kind of weigh the two, uh, especially like we've had this discussion before on writing in specific genres. Each genre has its own audience. And so you can write something for one audience that works quite well. If you try to write it for another audience, the audience may look at you and kind of go, huh? You know, what was that? You know, and so that's the other thing as a writer, um, and I think that has to go back with what we were talking about, figuring out marketing and distribution and everything. Writers have to decide what genre they really want to write in, um, and, and then at least be organized and truthful with themselves enough to say, hey, I'm comfortable writing in that j genre. Uh, Stephen King made the comment once that you can't go wrong if you write what you enjoy reading. If you have a right. specific type of genre you really enjoy reading, if you try writing in that genre, you're going to be more successful than if suddenly you just pick a genre out of the hat just for, oh, I'm going to get rich writing this way. If you don't enjoy what you're doing, it's not going to come out very well. Well, and that's one of the things that I've learned at conferences I've gone to, that each of us as a writer in a particular genre should be reading our genre just to see what the other writers are doing because it helps to improve our own writing. So in this general sense, has this book been a help for you in writing? Oh, yeah, because it's, especially the whole process of also, you know, the editing and trying to get it published and everything else. Just going back and reading it over and over and over and over again and going, all of a sudden, oh, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Why did I write it that way? That didn't work. So then you go back and you change it. And, and that's the other thing I think that, authors need to do, you need to go back through your own stuff. Yeah, you can get other opinions, but you need to keep going back and go through your own stuff and figuring out, did I really want to write it that way? Did I really want to say that? You know, and keep changing until finally you're going to get a fairly substantial uh, piece of work that you like. Five years from now, you may read it, and you're going to go, well, wait a minute. God, I could have done that better. Well, that's you can do for the next book you know, right, that type thing. And I think, well, you've, you're writing a, a series of books, and I think you've discovered that too, yeah. a series of thrillers with, with one main uh, There's a thread, thread going through it, yeah. yeah. But the same thing, as you write along, all of a sudden it's, well, wait a minute, I need to change this a little bit. Well, wait a minute, maybe that character should have done this, you know. And, and you evolve doing it. Yeah, do you ever read out loud to yourself of your material? Yeah. I'll try to act out some of the scenes and figure out, like, especially the action scenes, because I want to make the action scenes accurate. So you try to figure out, OK, if this guy does that to so-and-so, what's going to actually happen? And what is that going to look like? And once again, that comes back to some of my law enforcement background, because I was a, a firearms and use of force instructor for years. So you, you go through 30 years of training, and everything periodically somebody comes up with new ideas of how to do things, new ideas how to arrest people, new ideas how to shoot people, new ideas of all this stuff. So things change with time, but you also start realizing what is realistic and what isn't. I have to admit, I have trouble watching a lot of Hollywood epics now. Yeah. Because you watch them and you go, that's not what's going to happen in real life, you know. You're not going to have some guy on the screen that's, that's law enforcement officer that's going to shoot 20 people in two weeks and he's not going to, he's going to be right in the desk, you know, after that happens in real life because it's, he's a liability, you know. So it's trying to get that a sense of realism but also a, a sense of action because everybody likes, I mean, we're human beings, we like action. So you, you know? act out your uh, stuff just like Jack Lemon did with Verna Lisi in How to Murder Your Wife? Not that quite. Was a, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Not quite that specific. <laughs> <laughs> he carried out the entire, you know, because yeah. he was that. Um, was uh, he an anal? He was a cartoonist. He was anal too. Yeah, <laughs> and he had to do everything that was going to be in his next uh, story. Yeah, and of course, then his wife disappeared. Exactly. Yeah, and she so goes to get all those. That was yeah. a good movie. <laughs> you wrote your trilogy, your War and Peace, as you yeah. call it, um, and it's about this alien squid invasions that you, yes. as you call it. 
and you've pretty much gone through the the storyline itself. Yeah. Does your history of being involved in government as a special agent play a role in this book? Yes, because I delve into, like I said, the human condition, but also the dealing. Whenever humans get together, we always try to form some type of social order or government. And so I examine the failings of, that <coughs> go of the government and the short stories, especially I examine the failings during the initial days of the invasion as to what went wrong, mm -hmm. as to why. And part of that literally had to do with the fact that we fight with, our, with each other. And the fact that when the alien race comes, the one thing they don't understand is we do war on our own species. The, ch the Shah over the millennia don't do war because the most important thing to them is the protection of their young. Okay, so I wrote that in as this odd cultural dynamic. In their culture, everything revolves around ensuring that the young survive. If you are cause the death of a young squid, literally, um, the adult, there's a good chance, would go into a catatonic state and die. That's mm -hmm. how extreme this cultural dynamic that developed. So they don't understand our total warfare. They don't understand the fact that we should have recognized that they are now the top of the food chain according to Darwin. They don't understand that we, why we can't accept the fact that they're up here and we're down here now because they invaded and defeated us, supposedly. Yeah. We as human beings refuse to ever give up. I mean, we right. just have that in our own innate, you know, we're never going to give up. And so that's part of the other uh, uh, dichotomy that, that I look into and uh, examine. And once again, like you said, it goes back to dealing with human beings uh, under very stressful situations, but also dealing with human beings with huge bureaucracies. I examine that as to how, what will people do to survive, yeah. you know. Well, speaking of survival, the hardest part, of course, of having a book in the marketplace is trying to get it out there to new readers. Yeah. Last year, you and I did a couple of events out here in the county, and we're going to be doing these events again. So when you go to Whaling Days, you're going to look to see Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers. If you come to the Blackberry Festival in downtown Bremerton, you're going to find us there as well. Uh, last year we did it as a couple of authors. This year it's going to be more organized as um, CLAW. And um, I myself am going to be at the Kitsap County Fair. Uh, you can find us at uh, various markets. So is there anything else you're doing besides what we're planning? Well, of course, yeah, we're planning the Blackberry Festival and things like that. We're also, and this is kind of an aside off to the side, one of the things that I wound up getting involved in too because I wanted to learn how to write once again in, in different styles and genres. So I got with a, a young lady and we actually wrote a screenplay for mm -hmm. a completely unrelated movie that's sitting down in Hollywood right now. So just they've got some interest and we're going to see what happens, if, it's, if they're actually going to go through with it or whatever. Um, so I'm still continuing with that side of it and writing screenplays is different than writing novels because you definitely have to write specifically like the old expression is show it don't tell it you have to write more visually when you write something you have to think about okay I'm gonna write and I say this in one or two lines but how am I gonna film that how am I gonna show that on the screen like if by some sheer chance I was able to adapt one of my books to a screenplay you have to cut down all the nice little flowering descripti descriptive um, language Right, because that's you're left up to the scenery that's being exactly. In, you're going to show it. You don't need to explain yeah. it. You're going to show it. But most novelists, we have a tendency because we're used to. Oh, I've got to get down there and I got to. I've got to describe it so the reader can get it into his mind. Yes, this table is exactly. This is what we don't. In the yeah, screen. exactly. You know, the screen needs to show it. Table, boom, wood. You know, yeah. as opposed to you know, it's oh, it's mahogany or it's whatever. Yeah. You know. Well, if a book club or other organization wanted you to invite you to speak with them. How do we get a hold of you? I've got a, uh, of course, an email, which is glockmark 10 millimeter. Yeah, you with the fire instructor. So it's glockmark 10 millimeter at uh, AOL.com. I've also have a Facebook 
under Marshall Miller, my nom de plume for this series. I've also got a WordPress little blog under uh, Free Range Protocol. If you put in that on also Marshall Miller, it'll pop up also. Um, I'm on Facebook under my real name um, on the uh, uh, Tacoma Filmmakers and Tacoma Screenwriters groups. And we're also trying to form a Kitsap Filmmakers and Screenwriters group over here too that's going to be kind of affiliated with CLAW. Yeah. So you can also find me on our little CLAW Facebook that we're coming up with also. Very good. Well, I want to thank you, Mark, for all you do in CLAW and coming out to record this show. I look forward to continued endeavors with you in conjunction with Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers. You have hosted interviews in the past and will be hosting in the future. I've enjoyed your questions in last month's interview of me. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this month's interview of you. Yes. <laughs> I would like to thank all of our viewers for tuning in to Bremerton Kitsap Access Television and viewing this Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers production. I also wish to thank the BCAT staff on cameras and in the director's chair. Our broadcasts are scheduled for Saturday evenings at 6 p.m. And this show will air again on the fourth Saturday of May. Keep in touch with our Facebook pages to discover where you can meet local artists and authors. I hope everyone has a pleasant evening and a productive and fascinating week. And until next Saturday, I am Peter Stockwell with Kitsap Literary Artists and Writers in conjunction with Bremerton Kitsap Access Television. Good night. Mm -hmm.